Okay. You guys ready? Okay, guys, we're recording, so let's let's keep moving. All right. So differentiation rules. Okay. So what we know, the basic definition of a derivative is this, the limit as h approaches zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. We know this, right? And you know, by, you know, by doing this by brute force, like if you have a really crazy function, you got to plug x plus h and x take difference and go through all, all, all that algebra. It's not terribly efficient. I would not recommend that. So let's... Start thinking about this graphically numerically, and then we'll come up with some shortcut rules afterwards. Like, that's y equals 7, right? That's just a horizontal line. You know this, right? What's the slope of that line? Zero. There you go. That's your derivative, 0. So whenever you have a constant, f prime of x, regardless of what x is, is always going to be 0. And personally, I just I like to write the derivative like this. Remember, you can write, you can say dy or dx, you can say d dx of f of x. You know, there's a lot of ways to write the derivative. Um, or you could call it y, call it y prime. I don't care. But usually my habit is I'll do f prime of x. That's just what I do. All right, next step. If you have just y equals x, what's the slope of that line? One. So what's the derivative? One. Exactly. Slope is one the whole time. So f prime of x is 1. Yeah. This one we've done already um, in the notes or homework, I think. You guys remember what that one is? It's 2x, right? If you were to go through the motions and do the limit definition, which we have done already, straight up you just get 2x, right? Very simple. You guys remember x cubed? Yep. And are you guys seeing a pattern? Um, no, no, uh, the Pascal's triangle there is only for if you wanted to expand the whole thing. No, mm -hmm, not sure. You get 4x cubed in this case, right? But the reason why I, br I bring this up, this binomial expansion, is that if you were to plug in x plus h and put x to the 4 power and expand x plus h to the raise to the 4 power, Pretty insane, right? Because what's happening is that we have to expand all this. And actually, actually I think the coefficients are um, not mistaken. I think it's that. Yeah, those are the coefficients. But it's just a pain, right? You don't want to go through that, but you have to. So we want shortcut rules. Because so we keep doing the formal definition, the derivative limit definition of h approaching zero and all that jazz, not really worth it. If we have some ways that are more effective, that gets us the answer quickly. And this is called the power rule or the shortcut rule. And basically just says this. Now, I don't know why we write it twice, but whatever. Um, Remember, the notation for, for derivative could vary, like f prime or d dx of x to the n power, whatever, doesn't really matter. But the bottom line is, roll the exponent to the front and drop it by 1. So what's this one going to be? 8 times x what power? Boom, done. Now, if a constant, don't worry about it. Um, on the, Let's just... Here's what you're going to do. You're going to push 11 off to the side and do that. I think the reason why we asked you guys, you know what? Let's do this. Let me pull up the filled out version. Here we go. We actually, I should, I should show this to you because the more I think about it, that might be a lost opportunity. Okay. If you don't want to write the full answer, it's totally fine because I'll post this to Schoology. The filled out notes that's totally fine if you just want to kind of watch 
So, I mean, you guys know what's up, right? Like, okay, replace x with x plus h, and of course, it's right after that straight up. So, x plus h raised to the four power, which we know is insane, which is kind of crazy. Um, minus, uh, and then you can factor out the 11, right? Factor out the 11 from both of these expressions. Um, yeah, you expand that, that's just insane. But what's going to happen is that um, the x4 is going to cancel. You have a bunch of h's up top that will be pulled out. Ultimately, we know that this is represented as derivatives. So here's the part that's kind of interesting. We push 11 off, right? And for limits, remember the limit properties? Like we have two things being multiplied, you can do limits separately and times the limits. That's one of the limit properties. That's what's happening here. We're spreading up the limit into two limits. Limit of 11 is 11, obviously. Who cares? That's constant. Here, we know that this, this really represents a derivative. This is kind of key, the highlighting part. Because what does this represent? You should be able to recognize this. It's not really, yes, it's a limit. But it's not only you really have to um, evaluate, you just recognize it. it's just a derivative x to the four power. And we know what that is, 4x cubed. We saw the constant that's lingering. Multiply that constant to 4x cubed, what do you get? So the point being is that when you have a constant, you can push it off to the side. So I'll actually, here's what you could probably write in the notes. You could probably do this. f of x equals 11 times x to the four. When you take that derivative, that derivative is 4x cubed. And so f prime of x is 44x cubed. Done. That's it. OK. So the constant multiple rule. Uh, sometimes we'll use the letter u. I don't know why. Sometimes we just do. The Caesar constant is just this. U prime, du dx, tomato, tomato, doesn't matter, same thing. So here, there you go. So simple, right? Not that hard. Um, also, what if you're adding two functions or subtracting two functions? You want those derivatives. Just do them separately. 4x cubed over 2 plus 9x8 over 3. Uh, do simplify if you can. 2x cubed plus 3x8. By the way, on the AP exam, the college board does not care if you simplify or not. And they're not going to ask a question like this too easy, but in general, you don't have to simplify if you don't want to. It's your call. Actually, it's worse if you simplify because if you simplify wrong, you get you won't get the point. Better not. <laughs> you go ahead. So, like, if you're allowed to multiply for a constant, mm -hmm. are you not allowed to do that for a number variable? Yes, then that's what we're going to do today, I think. Uh, product rule. I think so. Hold on. Are we going to We are. You're a step ahead of me, maybe. Yeah. We'll get there. That's a much different ball game. Okay. Up to problem nine, we're okay so far. We're good. So even if you have a really long polynomial, whoop de do. Just take the one each one separately. There you go. So 30x squared minus 12x plus five. And what's the real 13, guys? It's a constant. Zero straight up. Right. Because it's just a constant. By the way, think of it like this. We have 5x. What's what's the exponent for x? So you move that to the front, and it's subtract the exponent by 1. That's x to the 0 power. What's x to the 0 power? So you just get 5. So the power rule does apply. We just don't think of it, because we know 5x has a slope of 5. But if you want to be mechanical about it, sure, do it. Like 13. 13 is multiplied to x, actually, believe it or not. It's been there the whole time, your whole life. It's been there even before we, were, we even existed. But what's the exponent for it? Yeah. So move it to the front. And drop it by one, but who cares? It's x and a one. What's zero times anything? So it works. It's it's 100% reliable. So you could always lean on it. So Now part B, let me uh, rewrite the derivative again. 30x squared 
minus 12x plus 5. So if you're asked to find the equation of the tangent line, now, equation of lines, I'm really going to um, emphasize this heavily. I do not want your answer in slope intercept form. You could do that, but if you mess it up, you'll lose a point. Leave it in point slope form because it's super easy. Just plug it for x1, y1, m, done. The college board agent doesn't even want you to write in slope intercept form. You can, but if you mess it up, you lose a point. They actually prefer this. Actually, this will make their lives much easier when they grade the AP exam. Like they, they just, they're looking for that. So the slope of the tangent line is really what? And from a calculus perspective, the slope of any tangent line for a curve, you have a curve, funky curve, the derivative, exactly. That's what we've been talking about the whole time. Absolutely. Okay, that's a crappy looking line. Just go with it. But the slope of that blue line is M, right? That's the slope of the tangent line. That's the derivative. And I, I already found it here. I got it. But what, what am I going to, I want the slope at what X coordinate? At zero. So F prime of zero is easy. That's five. And what's F of zero straight up? 13. So I'm going to say Y minus 13 equals five times X minus zero. All's good there? Make sense? And you write 5x, fine, I don't care. So let's keep moving. Okay. Um, horizontal tangents. That means that the slope is what? Or y prime equals zero. That's the calculus connection you have to make. You got a coordinate geometry understanding of it. Now we got a calculus understanding of it. And it's connected. Y prime is a slope at a particular value. So we got to find where that happens. So where does that happen? Well, let's find Y prime first. What's Y prime? Yeah. 4X cube. Keep going. Put zero here. Factor out four x. Keep keep the train moving here. That's all. Now this is the cool part. This is why I love calculus so much. Um, I think graph are pretty accurate now. I mean, well, kind of, not really. What's the y-intercept here? Seven. If I plug, um, and as x equals zero, that's going to be, um, we call it an extrema. The space being high or low. You can think about it. When you have a curve, yeah, I'm going to make this up, but the highs and lows, what, 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 what are the slopes of highs and lows? Wait, it's zero. Yes, calculus. But we haven't told you guys this for the last two or three years. We just said you'll learn eventually. Now you're learning. I was talking about this last night. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you just talk to me. Fine. The only issue is that I can't really factor this. So I don't know what the x intercepts are. So that's, that, so I don't want to actually attempt to graph for this. But yeah, the highs, but actually, my end behavior is off. My end, my end behavior should be pointing up, up, right? Because what's the leading term here? Positive. So it's positively coefficient, even degrees. So I actually should be, so I kind of messed up a little bit. That's okay. Um, but, but, well, thanks. One, two, three. All right. Zero. If I plug in two, I'm not going to plug in two. It's just going to get too nasty, but I don't know. Probably it's, I'm not 100% sure. I have, I have to plug back into the equation, but what I do know is that's probably going to look something kind of, Probably something like that. Okay. But all I have to do is plug in these values for x into the original function to get the y coordinates that go with them. And now I can make a more accurate graph. So, and there's also going to be a sign chart that we'll do with this too. Um, maybe what we'll do is maybe if we have some time at the end of the unit, we can talk about how to use the sign charts and derivatives. It's called the first derivative test. 
maybe we can do that when we get to. Yeah, so that because that will tell you then uh, whether the graph is increasing or decreasing. Like, but I'm not going to do that today because that's just a little too much for now. Okay, product rule. Here we go, guys. So. Before I do example 12, yeah. guys, quiet, please. Thank you. And you guys, don't write this down. Just, just watch for now. So we see something like this here. Here's how I think of this. If I have U times V, and I want the derivative of it, it's actually going to be this. Essentially, what you do is you take the derivative of one of the functions, multiply by the original of the other, plus vice versa. Give you a good example. Let's say let's say y equals um, x times x cubed. Let's say. I know that's x four, right? I know that. I get that. But let's do this. Again, you don't have to write this down. Just you just watch for now. Do you guess what I'm doing? I'm taking the derivative of x first times x cubed plus x times the derivative of x cubed. By the way, could I reverse? Could I reverse the order? Would it matter if I reverse the order? You could do it. Yeah, it wouldn't matter because it's plus, right? If I did derivative of x cubed first times x plus vice versa, wouldn't have matter. What's derivative of x, guys? So one times x cubed. Plus x was with x cubed, guys. 3x squared. So you get 4x cubed. By the way, if I just did derivative x4 straight up, what's that going to be? 4x cubed as well. So we see that it works. We see that it works. That like, okay, if I were to deal two different functions in terms of x and apply this product rule to it, it would have been the same thing if I just multiply these things together first. And then drive it, did then did the power rule afterwards. So, so why do we have this rule in the first place? Because sometimes you don't have the luxury of multiplying these two different expressions together. Like, what am I going to do with that? 4x squared plus 6 and tan x. Those are so different. Like, one's a polynomial, one's a trig function, right? Call this u, call this v. So do u prime times v plus u times v prime. And we'll do another one for the, the other function here. Oh, wait, sorry. This is a hint. Not, that's what I meant to say. Okay, 4x squared plus 6. What's the derivative of that? 8x. Mm -hmm. Just 8x, yeah. Times 10x. Plus... 4x squared plus 6 in parentheses, B, incredibly OCD through parentheses. And you're told what derivative tan x is, a secant squared x. You're told that. By the way, we are going to derive that later on. We'll get there. Actually, I think we do on Monday. Yeah, we do on Monday. Uh, and that's it. You're done. Steve, like that. Yeah, there's no need to do any more to that. And just so you know what we did, all this was all this. And all this was all this. Okay. So you guys see how that works? It's good. There's also a quotient rule. Um, that one, I have a little hard time remembering sometimes. Um, so the way this works, I think we're like this. Um, if u over v, in doing that derivative, I like thinking like this, u prime v, minus u v prime over v squared. Or <laughs> another way to think of this is, is this way. This is a little, kind of a little rhyme. Low and high. 
So we write as high. Pi D low minus low D high over low squared yes and away we go that's yeah, a little rhyme yeah so I be low minus low D high. I be low minus low D high over low squared and way to go. That helps. I don't know. <laughs> helps you. I be low minus low D high. If you talk to any siblings, they probably have heard of it. Who are taking this class? We're taking calculus. So. <laughs> so. Over low squared. And away we go. Yes, hundred percent. You have to. Yes, hundred percent. What's the plus? Uh, just make a rhyme. <laughs> so here we go, guys. <laughs> x squared plus 2 Over low squared. times 3x squared minus um, x cubed. The derivatives. I think you should simplify a little bit if you can. Um, like for example, on an AP exam, this this would be a multiple choice question, and multi and the choices would be simplified. So you should know how to simplify. Uh, you should get three x four plus six x squared. And if I clean up just a tad more, x4 and there you go. So that'd be the derivative of that graph or that equation. It's kind of crazy, but okay, we're okay. All right, we're we're moving. So for this one, I'm gonna do it two ways. Let's first say this. We would agree that's true. Right? I switch it to um an exponent. We should be very comfortable with that by now. This is why we spent all these years doing all this algebra stuff for these moments. You got to be very fluid with all your algebra. I trust you guys are, so I'm not worried about that. But you get that. Or it's that. So personally, I would do it this way. But if you want to do quotient rule, So low D high, what's the rate of one, guys? Minus high D low over low squared. Oh, it's just low squared, not low D squared? Nope. Oh, yeah, right. So you have negative 5 X4 over X10. What does that reduce to? So you still get the same thing. Put this way, it's kind of like if you want to get to San Francisco, you can take Highway 280 or 101. Doesn't matter. Take either one, right? Gets you the same place. It's your, it's your call. Yeah, I hate 101. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you I, Yeah, I like 280 better. Uh, hold on a sec, guys. Um, I do actually, so kind of weird, guys. I actually have an HVAC person in my house. I have to take this call. <laughs> I know it's really inappropriate. Once you guys write problems 15 and 60, I'll be right back. Sorry. I'll be right back, guys.
Oh, no, no, you so you can just do it from the first from over this data Yes. Okay. I got it. Let's take on it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. I have really yeah. We can tell yeah. the bears are yeah. yeah. like yeah. spawn two bears. Yeah. 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 Oh, I, and if you use a hybrid yeah. set strength thing, that's why yeah. it's like, yeah. <laughs> three bars. So three bars is somewhat All right. No, 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 I think it's seventy percent of the Okay, sorry guys. All right, here we go. So let's do this really quickly here. In this case, I would say y prime equals 14x6. And actually, before I even do this, let's let's prime it. Just like if you paint a house or paint a room, you, you want to put primer on. So I would actually do this first, then do derivative afterwards. Makes your life a little easier. Come on. So there you go, right? I mean, again, we don't really have to use a quotient if we don't want to. For three over x six. Okay. Now, let's move on to problem sixteen. Okay, I love problem sixteen because it really forces. Guess what? It really forces, especially part B. It really forces the issue of the quotient rule. There is a workaround. Some people have an apprehension of the quotient rule because of all the moving parts. So when we get to four point one, something called a chain rule. That in conjunction with product rule can bypass the quotient rule. It won't make much sense right now. By next week, it will make sense. There'll be an alternative to quotient rule if you have an apprehension to it. But part B is forcing the issue. Like you have to actually go about it because you're not given equations or expressions for W and U. But you're told that, hey, when um, I plug five in the W, I get negative two. Plug in five in the U, I get 10. Plug five in the derivative U, I get negative one. Plug in five in the derivative W, I get three. So again, if we just follow the quotient rule was supposed to be uh, low D high. So U times W prime minus um, W times U prime over U squared. And because we're plugging in five, and by the way, sometimes you'll see this, you see this in the calculator as well. You'll see a vertical line and a X equals five. What that means you're plugging five into the derivative. Sometimes you'll see that notation. That's actually how it's done in the TA4 calculator. If you go to alpha window or math and then deriv, it sh it, it'll have that notation there. So you're plugging five straight up into that derivative. Well, U5, I know is 10. W prime five is what? Three, be careful. W5 is negative two. So I'll put parentheses here, just to be safe. U prime five is negative one. And U squared, 10 squared, right? So you get 30 minus two over hundreds get 28 out of 100 you could leave it like that it's totally fine you don't need it. you don't need to reduce it all's good makes sense no oh. oh, terribly exciting <laughs> 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 
You don't look forward to it? That's a long day for you guys, I know. Okay, next up, there'll be 7 U Prime. Oh, boy. I need some space here. Let me clear. Okay, we're good. Then just plug in seven times negative one minus three times three minus five. Oh boy. What are we going to get here? Let me go back to red. Um, U prime five, like negative one times negative two. Plus UW prime is 10 times three, which actually is earlier. So negative seven minus nine minus five times 28. Negative 16 minus 140. Negative 156. We're okay with that? And I'll show you the filled out version. Oh, they don't show it. They don't show it. Never mind. Here we go. What was that? Sorry. You're right. I messed up. You're right. Oh, my goodness. You're right. Thank you. I messed up. My apologies. Here we go. Sweet. Okay. Let's keep on trucking here. Um, yeah, next up, I know this first derivative is going to be 8x cubed. It's easy. Minus 15x squared. You see how that we're just doing derivatives much more quickly now, right? So this is this is fantastic. Now, occasionally we do have to do a second derivative, um, especially we're going to talk about linear motion, I think, next time. If I'm not mistaken. Okay. For those of physics, you're going to love this because this is huge for physics, what we do on Friday. Uh, we'll talk about velocity and acceleration. Acceleration is like a second derivative. So we sometimes we have to do the derivative twice. Um, so what if you do it again? Great, just do it again. The answer is yes, of course I can. If I do it again, what do I get? 24x squared minus 30x plus 22, right? It's not hard. Can I do it a third time? Sure, why not? We rarely do it three times, though. That's incredibly rare. But there is for that one. Now, the corresponding notation for the second derivative in dy dx notation is, is written like this. Or like this. So we see that notation. It's weird. And don't ask right now, like, well, what does that mean? Like, are you squaring D, squaring X? This really actually won't make sense until you get to the second semester. So you get to the integral calculus. It really won't make too much sense what's actually happening here. So just go with the notation for now. Not really have that discussion yet, but it's really pushing it way too ahead. But if you could basically do the derivative of the derivative, that's what you're doing. This is the derivative. We know this now. You're doing this as an operator. You're doing the derivative again. But when you write, see it like this here, it just means, hey, I'm doing the derivative twice. That's what it means. With respect to x twice. 
So we saw this like thing about twice differentiable when we did IVT for derivatives. It means you're doing a derivative twice. Um, it actually second derivatives do play a very key role in understanding the curvature. It's called concavity, like when the curve flattens out or keeps rising. We could probably talk about that when we get to the end of this unit. Um, but something called concavity, which we'll hopefully we could talk about. Okay, almost done. Hmm, that's good. How do we know we've done our derivative correctly, right? So here you got the original function, x4 plus 4 thirds x cubed minus 12 x triple. So we actually saw this earlier. The derivative now we know is 4x cubed plus 4x minus 24x. But how do you know you got it, right? Like if you take a test, like what if I give you a really nasty one, right? And you, just, you don't know if you got it right or wrong. Here's how you can verify your work. Graph the original function, graph the derivative, and graph what you got by hand. So what the calculator... Graph the original for you. Of course, if you type this in wrong, that's your fault. But hopefully, you type this in correctly. If you do the derivative of the DDX of that y1, and then do what you got by hand, these two should verify each other. This will give you validation that you got this. Because they should be the same graph. If they're not the same graph. You messed up somehow. Somewhere along the way, you messed up. So I won't do it in the interest of time because I think you guys get the idea what you have to do. And so there you go. So there's a way to verify your work. Okay, so that covers 3.3. .3. Uh, homework, guys. And this is the rest of the units. Homework's going to be handout D156. And then some book problems. The actual problems are written on the solutions. Those are actually the um, problems I want you guys to do. Um, I'm going to put in school G right now. But uh, the solution key, you guys don't have yet. They, they're just getting photocopied. I'm going to bring it to you guys in just a second. But what I want you guys to do is do 156 of handout D. And then from pages 126 to 128, so in that packet I just gave you guys, you should see the book, the, the page numbers for the textbook. It's, it's basically section 3.3 .3 homework. And you're going to be doing 17, 24 CD, 27, 30, 33, 35, 37, 41 all. I have all the answers here. Let me go pick it up. From handout D and then the textbook 126 to 120, those prompts specifically. So the homework prompts are actually on the answer key. Let me go get it for you guys. So I'll put it in school as well. Yeah. Actually, some I already have right now. And I think that's it.